How's it going out there? It's June 30th. And I'm Frank Kersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged Podcast, where I break down headlines and uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. Crazy few weeks. Earnings season, kind of in the middle of it here. Not a lot of news out. You know that there's a 24-hour cycle of news and financial news, right? It's 24 hours, so they have to report something. So a lot of stories get amplified when they're not really a big deal. But there was one thing I wanted to talk about that was very, very important that happened. It was just a few days ago. And it was the banks. So the banks came out with the stress test results. Annually, you do these stress tests, making sure they're secure, they're fine, they withstand so many different things. Cover that in a second. And in short, as expected, all the banks passed the stress test. Now, these banks, they have around $175 billion combined in excess capital. That's how easily they pass. Now, to put that in perspective, it equates to about 10% of the average market cap. So, in other words, let's take JP Morgan, right? Largest bank in the world. Its market cap is $460 billion. That's $46 billion in excess capital that it has now. And what are they going to do? They're going to buy back a lot of their stock, increase their dividend. They just made a recent acquisition. They paid a few fines, I think they announced. Sort of like a platform that wasn't regulated. We don't admit any to doing anything wrong, but here's a couple million dollars to the SEC. You know, they all have that worked out, which is all cool. But when I put the entire thing in perspective, and this is a story that's not being told here, because I saw an interesting quote from, this is a Federal Reserve president, it's from Minnesota, Neil Kashkari. So Kashkari has a nice history. He was the former intern head of the Treasury Department's Office of Financial Stability, right? So he oversaw the Trouble Asset Relief Program, and that was during the credit crisis, which bailed out every major bank, right? He oversaw it, so he knows exactly what's going on. Now, after these stress test results, he comes out and says, it was right after they released, that the losses in the banking sector were much smaller than expected because governments were aggressive in providing fiscal support to families and businesses affected by the COVID crisis, which I agree, right? You gave everybody money, so it wasn't a big deal what happened to anything. It was just, hey, let's give... Guys, ten and a half trillion more is coming, and and I say the government, I include the Fed, the government, because the Fed is the government, right? I mean, it's the same thing now. We know that for for the past, you know, how many administrations? Uh, you know, Donald Trump control the Fed. We see uh, Biden administration. I mean, they control the Fed, right? The Fed operates based on, on who's in office, right? So it's supposed to be separate. It's never separate. But now we're looking at ten and a half trillion dollars in checks. So I agree with him. I definitely agree with him. Then he said they should have even higher requirements. These banks than are already in place. Because banks cannot expect the government to bail them out of every crisis. This is Kashkari. This is what he said. Okay, wait a minute. Higher requirements. Right now, the annual stress test for banks, and these are put in place after the credit crisis, call for banks to have enough capital to withstand a 10% plus employment rate, a 35% drop in commercial real estate prices, and a 55% drop in the stock market. This is put in place, just percentages that they throw out there. I don't know how they calculated them. But to put those three events in perspective, together, they've only happened once in our entire history. And it wasn't during COVID. Commercial real estate held up well. Stock market did not fall below these levels, below 55%. It didn't happen during a credit crisis. Stocks fell around 35%. You have to go back to the Great Depression between 1929 and 1931, which means that these events are never, ever, ever going to happen together. And even during COVID, if they do happen, we have a government that's just going to throw trillions at the market anyway. So why do you have these requirements in place for the banks? When are you going to bail them out anyway? You're saying, oh, we're not going to bail them out in the future. I mean, Kashkari, here's a newsflash for you. You're the asshole that bailed them out. Being in charge of TARP in 2008, you know the whole system. Come on. And where are we today because of these new rules put in place for banks, which you had a hand in? Well, let's let's revisit that. In 2007, pre-credit crisis, J.P. Morgan had a market cap of $140 billion, which fell to around $70 billion before it bounced back up in 2009. Every bank got nailed. So much more than J.P. Morgan. Back then, I don't even give you the $140 billion in 2007. You guys, Fed, government, deemed them too big to fail. At $140 billion market cap. 
Now, we look at today, because of your requirements you put in place, which, by the way, you want to increase. You just said you want to increase, right? JP Morgan has a market cap of $460 billion, almost three times as large. And you're saying banks can't expect the government to bail them out of every crisis? You have to. If you couldn't let these banks fail whenever, 10 plus years ago, during a credit crisis, when their market caps are 25% of what they are today, how in the hell can you let them fail in the future? You can't do it. So you know what? Stop grandstanding. Stop the bullshit. We see it from a mile away. Oh, they need higher requirements. I mean, if you look at the banking industry, it's one of the only ones, and believe me, I'm getting to a bigger point here because I'm going to make you guys a lot, a lot of money. It's going to be very, very simple to make money, okay? I'm going to explain it to you. Because if you look at banking, it's one of the only industries where the main players will remain dominators forever. They have no competitive threats. In other words, you're not going to see a mid-cap bank suddenly grow into a mega cap. It's not going to happen. You can't have a Citizens Financial Key Corp. These are like large regional banks. Expand to the point where they have a greater market cap than the J.P. Morgan's, Bank of America's, and Wells Fargo's. The current laws don't allow it. It doesn't allow it. They're in place. Hey, Facebook, trillion-dollar company, came out of nowhere. Google at one point. I mean, you know, you create the right company. A lot of times these guys get bought out early on because there's so much cash in the balance sheets of technology companies, but you have a shot to become an industry leader and disrupt. You're not disrupting banking. I mean, it's got to come from the top because even if you do, you'll get bought out, but there's laws in place that they're not going to have competition which is insane. But you're looking at the stress tests. So the stress test, when I say the current laws don't allow it, here's the biggest requirements. So the biggest requirements, which are for any bank that holds more than $250 billion in assets, right? This amounts to 23 banks. So this is the biggest requirement that they have to have on the book. So the biggest requirement, it's called Common Equity Tier 1 Capital, CET1 for short, okay? I'm going to make this very simple. I don't want to get too complicated, but it's very important to understand this. It's the core capital, which is common stock, retained earnings, preferred stock, a bank holds in its capital structure. And the CET1 ratio, it's a very big deal with stress tests and banks. I know if you don't know the banking industry, you're like, what the hell is this? I'm explaining it to you. The CET1 ratio compares a bank's core capital against its risk-weighted assets, which simply means this determines a bank's ability to withstand a financial distress or a crisis which they put in place, which is the 55% mark collapse, 35% drop in, in you know, home prices, or commercial real estate, and you know, just they, they put those measures, whatever measures are put in place by regulators, right? So again, I don't want to get too complicated and lose you here, but regulators require that a tier one capital ratio should be at least 4.5%. So just know 4.5% is a big deal. So lower and you fail. Now, I don't know if anyone took a look at this stuff. A few people did. A few analysts did. But I'm going to put something in perspective so you understand how powerful these banks are. So if you're looking at the minimum CET ratio, 4.5% across the board for all these 23 banks, you're looking at an average. They're above the average by over double. So by 10%. So you're looking at 4.5% minimum for Bank of America. It's 11.8%. For Citibank, it's also 11.8%. For Morgan Stanley, it's 16.7%. What does that mean? That directly leads to capital. So the 11% for Bank America, again, trying to make this simple, the number you really need to know is it amounts to $25 billion in excess capital based on their market cap. So if you take JP Morgan, it's $13 billion. Now, JP Morgan is a bigger company, so it's not a big deal. But here's where it gets crazy. When you're looking at these numbers, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Morgan, you know, some of the, they have Citigroup, they have massive market caps. But if you're looking even at a Wells Fargo, so their capital ratio, that, that C, the, the CET1, again, minimum 4.5% below that is bad, came in at nearly 12%. That amounts to $32 billion in excess capital, which is 18% of their market cap. 18% of their market cap, which they could use for what? To increase dividends, buy back their stock, and acquire companies. Now, three stocks from this, and they all passed very, very easily. Again, the average passed by 10%, but there's three stocks, Wells Fargo, PNC. So PNC, 
amounts to 17% of, of their market cap. So they have $13 billion in capital amounts to 17% of their market cap. But the big name here is Capital One. So Capital One has $22 billion in excess capital if you compare that to that market cap. That amounts to 32% of their market cap. Think about that for a minute. I mean, you have $100 billion, you have a little over $30 billion that you could only use, really, you can't really use it too much, right? You could acquire some companies, but now they've got the green light to buy back a ton of their stock and to increase their dividends in a zero interest rate environment where the banks already pay pretty good dividends. So when you're really looking at the numbers that these guys are reporting, the stress tests are meaningless. No one's ever going to fail it again. And we just went through COVID and they were immune for COVID because the government said, here, here's 10 and a half trillion. We're going to bail out the world. And they're going to do that every single time we have a crisis going forward. Every single time. Why? Because they haven't seen the consequences of being wrong. The credit crisis, they were right. Hey, what were the consequences? Nothing. What? Higher debt? Who cares? Does that stop stocks, equities, household wealth from going to record highs? No. Same thing with COVID. Let's just throw money at it. That's why I'm so concerned with inflation. Because inflation is something that the Fed can't control by throwing money at it. They actually have to do the opposite and take money out of it, which is going to be extremely, extremely painful and result in a lot of stocks, especially high P names, getting wrecked. I'm still on defense. I warned. I don't think this is tra transitory. I hope it is. But if it's not, we're going to have the Fed raising rates, stop buying bonds, stop throwing money into the system. It's going to get a little crazy out there, guys. You're going to see a market that you're not used to over the past, what, 12 years? Since the credit crisis? But more important, anyone telling you that another credit crisis, I'm not saying we can't see a 10, 20% market pullback. We could easily see that, depending on, on what happens with the economy and jobs and whatever. But I'm talking about a credit crisis. So anyone telling you that another credit crisis, which we heard from how many bears over the past 10 years, it's coming, it's coming, look at the debt levels of credit. Again, you don't have to worry about debt at all. The only thing you have to worry about is if it's being paid and paid on time. And it is. And it is. And the banks just report that in the stress tests. Loan loss is going down. Things are better. But anyone telling you another credit crisis is either trying to sell you something or is just an idiot that doesn't know how to read balance sheets. Because again, you look at the banks, loan losses are down incredibly across the board for the banks. Excess capital at record highs. Net interest margins have gone higher, have gone higher. I'm not talking about margins for technology companies. These guys, their net interest margin has a lot to do with interest rates. So interest rates go higher. These guys usually make more money. Banks make more money. It's, it's good for banks in terms of profits when interest rates go higher. They increase that spread, that net interest margin. They found a way to increase margins in the lowest interest rate environment in history. I mean, just a guess here, it might be... You know, generating a lot of money by giving you zero interest on your checking accounts, but charging you 20% interest on your credit cards. That's probably a pretty good thing for them. Or you know, it's amount of fees you, you, you have to pay to send a wire, transfer money, fees on their investment funds. I mean, you know, these guys make fees. About, you have their money there and you're paying fees, 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 fees for everything. If you're filthy rich, yeah, they give you all the breaks. If not, they wreck you. I mean, the banks, they've never been stronger in the history of our nation. The environment has never been better. Where how many institutions and businesses are borrowing money like crazy? And consumers have more money than they ever had. And they're paying this off. They're lending money like crazy. Go nuts. Household wealth at a record high. Massive buybacks coming. Much higher dividends coming. And inflation, which we all see coming, is going to result in higher rates. Which is going to increase... They're net interest margins, which they're already doing well on. And the kicker here, banks, holy cow. I mean, you see what they're trading at? JP Morgan's trading 11 times forward earnings. Wells at 12 times forward earnings. City at eight times. Goldman Sachs at eight times. You can say, well, that's where the sector trades. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But banks, especially investment banks, holy cow, they're growing earnings much faster than the overall market. And again, they're going to increase buybacks, increase dividends, which are already large, people are dying for income. And from a risk-adjusted basis, banks, by far, by far, by far, not even close, is the best sector you can own. Nobody's even close on a risk-adjusted basis because they're buying back stock. They don't have to see massive growth in their earnings to see earnings 
go higher because you know they're buying back their stock, taking more shares off the market. Now I know something. <laughs> I know that you hate banks. And I get it. I mean, what they did to cause a credit crisis, I mean, take on excess leverage without anyone knowing behind the scenes, even the regulators didn't know. So they inflated profits. Why? To pay themselves huge bonuses. They all made out like bandits. It was great until it wasn't great anymore. And everyone was on the take. Everyone. Insurance companies, credit region agencies knew the deal, mortgage origina originators who, who basically sold any loan. You needed, how much money you got in the bank? Just, is it positive? Yeah, I have 50 bucks. Okay, you're good. Uh, what kind of ID do you have? You have a library card? Okay, here's a $600,000 loan. Why did they do that? Because they made the fees off of that and then gave the loan to Fetty and Franny and unloaded the risk. A government organization that doesn't really freaking pay attention, just like the post office, right? Same thing. It's why the post office loses billions and billions and billions of dollars every year, yet UPS and FedEx, their profits skyrocket because they don't care. They don't care. It's not run like a business. It's run as, hey, you know, let's just try to do the right thing and hire certain people and whatever. You know, that, that's, that's our government. That's why the government sucks at running businesses because there's no checks and balances ever. You can lose as much money you want and don't worry about it. We'll give you more. It's fine. We got it. We'll get it someplace. Now look at the infrastructure bill. Infrastructure bill is coming out. What is it? 9% of the bill is infrastructure? Are you kidding me? We all know. We all see it. But getting back to hating the banks, I mean, these guys almost crashed the entire global financial system, the entire financial system. And what was their punishment? What was their punishment? After generating hundreds of billions in revenue and these guys generating millions of dollars for themselves and those bonuses, a few billion dollars in fines. No jail time for anyone. No way. And, yet, and the Fed, what do they do? They put laws in place to make these banks even stronger than they were pre-credit crisis. That's why it's a Jill Kashkari saying, oh, well, you, we're not always going to be there. You can't expect us to be there. You have to be there. You don't have a choice. They're much, if they were too big to fail, JP Morgan was too big to fail at a $140 billion valuation. Don't you think at a $460 billion valuation, it's definitely too big to fail? You don't think these are too big to fail? They're always going to be too big to fail because it's a limited sector. It's 23 banks. You have the large banks. No one can be lost. It's not going to be spread out. You're not going to diversify the risk. They're all intertwined somehow or another. You're always going to bail them out. Just say it. Just say it. Have the balls to say it. So, yes, I understand most people hate banks. I think they're assholes as well. But don't ever let your emotions get in the way of your ultimate goal. And what is your ultimate goal as an investor? It's to increase your household wealth, to retire early, to make sure your kids are taken care of. That's everyone's goal. I don't care if you're a Democrat, a Republican, all investors, that's what we want to do. We want to build our wealth over time and make sure our families are financially secure and their families are financially secure. That's everyone's goal. That's what we all want to do. That's a one universal that we could all agree on. I mean, it's not, talk about investors here, not gamblers, which 99% of those people will lose their money. I mean, you look at people who bought AMC or GameStop, great. You're know, sitting on massive gains. Maybe turn their portfolio into a couple million dollars or whatever. But when you do that, you know, gambling, you think about gamblers, right? The more you win, the more they gamble. You want proof, the NFL, they have the early games and the late games. If you have two games that you like and they're both in the early games and you win them, you're definitely betting the late games, even though you didn't like any of the late games because you just won. That's what gamblers do. I'm not talking about that crap. I'm talking about investors, long-term goals. Increasing your household wealth, thinking about your kids, your families, getting married, whatever. So when it comes to banks, you need to have at least one big bank in your portfolio. I recommended Goldman Sachs a year ago when everyone, everyone hated banks. That's what you want to buy. Now everyone's starting to like them. It doesn't matter. Based on these stress tests and the amount of, of capital they have on the balance sheets that they're going to use to buy back stock, increase their dividends in, in, in a market where it's impossible to get high yields sometimes. In most places. But we're up 77% on that position in Goldman Sachs. And I think it's going a lot higher. But right now, the three I mentioned, Wells Fargo, PNC, especially Capital One, these guys have tons of capital. 17, 18, 32% of its market cap and capital that they, they're going to use to buy back stock, acquire companies, and raise their dividends. And that's all coming. 
But if you're looking at all strong buys, although I think you could probably pick any single bank, any one of those these 23 out of a hat, and it'll easily outperform the market over the next three to five years, even a 10-year period. There's just, the tailwinds are too great. You have inflation coming, right? It's higher rates coming. It could take a year or two, whatever. The Fed said, which is amazing, right? A couple of weeks ago, everyone said, they're tapering. Oh, 18 months, they say. 18 months from now, we may look to, to, to raise rates. And we're not going to stop buying bonds. No, it, it, it's pure easy. But they're going to get there. Whether it's 18 months, two years, two and a half years, you're going to see rates go high. As they do, that increases their net interest margins. Massive buybacks coming, guaranteed. Increasing their dividends, guaranteed. And the biggest kicker of all is what we just saw during COVID is the Fed and the government, which are the same thing. They'll always be there during a crisis. They'll always be there to bail out the economy, which is basically bailing out the banks, injecting $10.5 trillion into the market during COVID. The banks didn't miss a beat. So own the banks. At least one of them should be in your portfolio. Again, from a risk-adjusted basis, you're not going to find a better sector. You will not find a better sector to buy because these returns are going to be much, much greater, and you're not going to have to take on a lot of risk because everything's there. Higher interest rates benefits these guys. If we have a crisis, it benefits these guys because the government's going to bail them out. They have to. They're too big to fail. So what's the risk here? You're looking for income. Here you go. Look for companies that are going to buy back their stock, which will not artificially inflate earnings, but it's going to push earnings even higher. Probably higher than the industry or the S&P 500, which is trading at 21 times forward earnings. These guys are trading at what? 10, 11, 12 earnings? Single digits for Citigroup? I mean, holy cow, but this is a story I feel like nobody's telling. Yeah, they passed the stress test and everything is good. I, I just want to give you the details behind it because I love looking under the hood and explaining things because then you could say, holy cow, this makes so much sense. I know it's difficult. Again, even if I recommend a tobacco stock, my, my dad died of lung cancer. I put that aside. My job, the reason why people pay for my newsletters is to make them money. If I see an opportunity that's going to make you money, whatever sector it is in, I'm going to recommend it. If it's really that personal to you, don't buy it. I get it. I understand. But when it comes to the banks, you can still hate them. You can still hold up a sign if you want in front of Bank of America's all over the country, wherever you want to do, and just you know, create Facebook groups and rallies against them, whatever. Just own them. Make sure you own them. It's like Facebook. They collect all your data. We all know we all hate it. It's going higher. They have access to, to over 2 billion people of everything they're doing every single second. And now they have AI all of it. They know exactly what you're going to do in 10 minutes from now, tomorrow, next week, and six months from now. Which advertisers pay an absolute fortune for. That's what companies want when it comes to their ad budgets. And the banks definitely own them because they have lots of tailwinds. They'll always get bailed out. Definitely put one of these in your portfolio. So speaking of the whole economic environment, especially inflation, today's guest is Ginia Terranova. She's the editor of Money Flow Trader and Unlimited Income. We recently launched that. That's for Curzio Research. Not sure if you know this, even if subscribers know this, but Ginia is a former economic professor. Uh, and we're going to really dig deep on that biggest risk at everyone's portfolio, like I said. And that's inflation because it's something the Fed can't bail out, right? You're not going to be able to throw money at it. That's the biggest risk. So she really digs in deeper, deeper than even I do. She's much smarter than me when it comes to, to, to the economy. Uh, it's going to be a great conversation. It's not going to be boring, I promise. Then she's going to talk about option strategies, which, holy cow, I mean, option contracts exploding, right? I mean, so many people get into options. But she explains how everyone can use them to hedge your portfolio, which, by the way, is super easy to do. I feel like a lot of retail investors still don't do this. And it can be done in any online brokerage account, simple as, as buying a stock. She's going to break that down. We're also going to discuss the winning formula for generating income. And it's not compounding. It's not buying equities with high yields. It's not reinvesting dividends, believe it or not. It's a formula that few people use. A formula with Ginia used to perfection thus far in a limited income newsletter that has helped subscribers immensely to the tune of 18 positions are in her portfolio right now. Every single one is up. Other than one, which she just made like three weeks ago, it's down 0.8%. Every, the whole portfolio is up. The whole portfolio is up. And we know from the market, yes, we see stocks all-time highs. There's a lot of stocks that are still trading 20, 30, 40% off their highs. She's doing a fantastic job because she follows a formula that few people talk about. Because everyone looks at income, they look at that interest rate, she's going to break it down to you. Most important, She's going to share her favorite income name with you, which 
most people will never invest in this name for income. And that's why it's important to listen to this. There's a reason why unlimited income is you know, one of our fastest growing newsletters and people are in it. It's great. I just feel like it, you know, people see income and it's boring. And it's terrible. This is how you invest in income where it is exciting. And it's a formula that I'd say 95% of the people in newsletters I see out there don't pay attention to. Definitely, definitely pay attention to this. She's going to give you a favorite idea and you're going to learn a lot from this interview. And let's get to it right now. Jenny at Terranova, thanks so much for joining us on Wall Street Unplugged. My pleasure. Hello. Well, so, okay, so you write our Money Flow Trader newsletter, and you also write uh, one of our recent launch newsletters, Unlimited Income, which we're going to get to in a minute. But I think a lot of people don't know this about you, uh, is that you used to be an economics professor. And I know through your newsletter, you explain, which is a top-down approach, and you look at the economy. I want to start there, because that's why I get the most questions from when it comes to subscribers in terms of inflation. They see they're out in the real world, the labor shortages and what's going on out there, and prices are being raised across the board. What are your thoughts right now where we have stocks at all-time highs, earnings are up tremendously, and they're expected to be up tremendously year over year, which is not only year over year, but they're at record numbers, meaning that they're higher than pre-COVID. Uh, we've seen 9.3 million people unemployed, but 9.3 million jobs are, are out there, right? So, so are, are available. Uh, you're looking at home prices at record highs, get stocks at record highs, all asset prices near record highs, yet- the Fed is still pedal to the metal saying this is going to be transitory and there's nothing at all to worry about. What are your thoughts and how, do, how are you playing this in, in your newsletters? Because I, for me, it seems like inflation is guaranteed. It's here right now. We all see in every economic indicator. But uh, you know, according to the Fed, it's transitory and everything's going to be just perfectly fine. Everything might be just perfectly fine, but there are, the chances are that it uh, the inflation is here to stay. It might be a little lower than the current 5% on the uh, Fed's preferred, uh, uh, 4% on the Fed's preferred measure, maybe a little bit higher. And then they're going to go and say, yeah, you know what, wait a little longer, we'll average it down a little bit. And then, then we had the uh, years of deflation, so we'll have to go out a few years more. And the problem with inflation is that it throws everything out of whack. It just, you know, some sectors start grow faster, some so the, the, the costs accelerate, then the profit begin to fall. And then, you know, that's some sectors begin to play catch up and uh, materials uh, honestly often go totally crazy. And that by itself can start a new cycle and a new crisis. Inflation is not something to mess with. And uh, in this situation, as we have today, for all this money, they just simply chase a limited amount of goods. There's nowhere for this money to go. And I think it's as simple as that. You can't put this money in the bank. Well, you can, but why? <laughs> There's not, the interest is zero and uh, minus inflation will be negative. So you let it do something in the real world, be it the market or uh, the economy. So it is a little bit stimulatory, but the, this stimulus will uh, uh, play itself out to the way that inflation will continue to be a big factor. So I, uh, I think it needs to be uh, seen as uh, a real phenomenon and not likely a transitionary uh, phenomenon that will uh, stop in 2022. It's not, there's no magic uh, economic event that will begin in 2022 after which inflation will suddenly stop. It's just not going to happen mm -hmm. unless we begin uh, slowing down the money printing and possibly raise rates which, again, not likely to happen. Yeah, You know, it's funny because a couple of weeks ago, the Fed came out with their meeting, and a few days after that, the market really came down saying that, you know, they're going to taper. I didn't see anything of that nature at all. I have no idea what everyone's talking about. Maybe that's why the market's bounced back to new highs. But what I heard is we're not touching interest rates for 18 months, which is a really, really, really long time. We're not going to stop buying bonds anytime soon. And you're going to be fine. It's going to be transitory, which the Fed said 
we're not telling you how long transitory is. <laughs> you know, it, that's, you know, definition is brief, which I would think three to six, three, four, five months, you know, it could extend into next year. So we talked just before this and discussed this, and I, I'm going to ask you the question that you asked me because it's important. When we looked at 2008, we saw a Fed that, or even 2007, the Fed was raising interest rates and they were wrong. They didn't know what was going on, and, and, and but they they said, okay, and reversed it, which is fine. Why wouldn't they do that today and say, okay, we're gradually going to raise rates, and if it's transitory, you know, we could take whatever, we could take them back, whatever it is. But they're seeing things that aren't there to the point where, you know, we they're saying that we still haven't seen this come out of the woods from COVID, which we have on every single level. Asset prices, you're looking at jobs, we're looking at everything, right? The actual unemployment rate isn't as low, and that's what they're focusing on, but it really is. If if we stop giving free money to people, they're still printing like crazy. Again, everything is is more better, profits, margins more. Better than they've ever been. So I'll ask you the question he asked me, like, what is the Fed afraid of here? Because everything is pointing for them to gradually just start taking away the punch bowl. It just makes sense where we are right now. But we're not seeing that at all. And it's leading to massive speculation. Very easy to raise money these days. Uh, you know, ESG companies with no profits going through the roofs, the AMCs and everything. You're just seeing so much risk taking and, and craziness out there. But, you know, what is afraid? What what is the the Fed afraid of? You asked me that, and I don't know. I said politically, you know, it seems like it's more a po- organization that's politically controlled than ever. Happening Trump administration, even now, they're supposed to be separate. But you know, why wouldn't the Fed use a strategy like that? And, and I guess we can go into the consequences if we do see uh, a lot more inflation. Uh, I don't know if they're exactly political or if there's anything they know that we don't know. But it looks like uh, they just are afraid of uh, the tantrum. They don't want a uh, stronger dollar. Uh, we want to be on the same page as uh, the rest of the developed world, which is also in the extreme easing, uh, in the state of our extreme easing, money printing, and zero or negative interest rates. So we really, we just, uh, we all march together, but where are we going? Uh, I guess we're, we're going to find out relatively soon whether it's going to be higher inflation or it was just a big scare, nothing to, 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 nothing to worry about. We'll, we'll leave 2021 with the inflationary spike as if it never happened. I don't think so. And most of our, you know, the observers really are skeptical. Uh, but uh, you know what? I think they're all afraid of the tantrum that the market would throw. And uh, the market is so used to free money that it will throw a big tantrum. And again, mm-hmm. it's it's a uh, vicious circle. Now, tantrum, d- talk about that because when I look at tantrums, I'm looking at, at- you know, what industries are going to be impacted the most. And one of the things that you wrote about in your newsletter was, you know, higher inflation means higher PE stocks are at a disadvantage. Uh, can you explain that? Because we're seeing, you know, sectors within technology where PE ratios are through the roof. We're actually seeing it in restaurants now and retailers. I mean, trading at, you know, incredibly high, historically record high valuations here. And again, we have a perfect environment with free money and low interest rates. And I get it. But if we do get inflation, yeah, is this one of the these some of the industries that can get hurt the high P names and one of the sectors that you actually brought up, which you know I want you to go into more detail because it was amazing, is cloud computing. Because right away we think, you know, Microsoft, we think Amazon, uh, Google, those are the three leaders. Those guys are going to be perfectly fine. But if you're looking at the individual and tons of those little you know niche companies within cloud, and they're trading at enormous PEs. I mean, even you know the snowflakes, which have everything and and all the analytics and stuff like that, they're trading at at, at PEs that, that are pretty much insane. Now, these are the names that you should be worried about if we do see inflation tick a lot higher than, than what everyone's expected here. I do, and uh, I would. <laughs> uh, the uh, if if the market is anything uh, except for a uh, big uh, casino. We should all worry about high P stocks in the high inflation because what are, at least in theory and mostly in practice over the years, the market uh, assigns value to future profits. It's all there is. 
you buy a corner grocery, uh, not for what they did yesterday, but what they for the, for the business they would do tomorrow and the, the years ahead. And you don't want to pay too much. You want to pay just right so you can leave of that corner grocery. Again, I'm, I'm simplifying, but that's, that's basically the same principle should apply to stock market. You, you, you value stock on the basis of its future profits. The, the profits could be far, far, far in the future, and that's fine, but you don't want to pay too much for that future growth. And the value of that paying too much is actually going down as inflation is accelerating simply because uh, you might be able to get that amount of money from somewhere else without paying too much today. It's just not worth the, the risk. The my, this money today versus future money, inflation reduces the value of future money. High P stocks, that applies to them as well. Cloud computing is a great example, but of course not every cloud stock is going to be uh, impacted. Amazon, Microsoft, they're very expensive, but they're not as expensive as uh, Zoom or uh, uh, Coupa software or any other smaller cloud stocks that you can think of. In 2017 or 18, you couldn't give away many of those clothes, cloud software stocks. Mm -hmm. I know, I know that the, the, the COVID changed everything, but did it change everything to the, uh, uh, to the, that the profit don't matter anymore? Uh, probably not. So I'm thinking that investors eventually would still want to see profits and they want to see profits sooner rather than later and they want to pay less for the unit of future profits if they see high inflation that's why high pe stocks might be in big trouble again if inflation continues to stay here or accelerates no, it definitely makes a lot of sense. And thank you for explaining that too, because uh, sometimes people just say, hey, high PE stocks are going to get hit. But I, I love the, the explanation, which you also do great in your newsletter. And I, I want to transition to that to, to Money Flow Trader. Kind of threw you into the fire a little bit, right? <laughs> when, because you know, this was designed, this newsletter, and, and we changed a little bit of the format, which is great because you can go long as well and use option strategies. But it was meant to really hedge your portfolio, right? Because stocks have been hitting all time highs almost every single year since the credit crisis. Uh, the timing, was perfect in terms of COVID, which, you know, we saw a lot of industries and many, many stocks get hit. But now, even though stocks were seeing all time highs, we're seeing certain sectors get hit. I mean, ESG sectors got hit. We saw SPACs get hit. Some of the high growth names gotten hit. You know, I've seen names down still 40, 50% from their highs, especially companies that just IPO'd in the last like, uh, you know, pretty much seven to, to 10 months or so, last couple quarters. Uh, Explain money flow trader and, and because you use simple option strategies to help hedge your portfolio. And I think that sometimes when people when they see a portfolio, they'll see, hey, there's a few things that are down and, and, and you know, but, but you're only risking as much money as you put in because you do it a special way. I'll let you explain it. Uh, but how important is it to hedge your portfolio? Because I think what I'm trying to do here with Curzio Research is explain how professionals invest and they're, they're always hedging themselves just in case because you're going to be wrong. And, you know, sure, if that hedge doesn't work out, pretty much everything else should work out very, very well to cover that. And yet, if everything else goes down, that hedge could be worth more than 30, 40, 50 percent of your portfolio. But yet, when you see stock continue to hit all time highs, it's not the easiest thing. And I think this trend is going to break with inflation here. But yeah, I think Money Flow Trader over the next couple of years might be set up as one of the best newsletters we have in our suite of newsletters. Uh, but why don't you go explain it yourself? Because that's why I created this. You have changed this model. It's been fantastic. You've been long and, and doing great. So uh, yeah, explain the importance of, of you know hedging your portfolio in the product. Well, um, as you said, uh, absolutely correctly, you pointed out that uh, you want to be able to be invested without worrying too much of what happens with the market tomorrow. Long-term investing is the key to long-term wealth. This said, 
nobody can time the market. We can understand what's going on. We can analyze it to the best of our ability or and discuss about inflation and, and discuss inflation till we're blue in the face. But the market has its own ways. <laughs> and, you know, somebody said that, mm-hmm. you know, the market is best at making you feel the maximum pain. Well, you will not feel the, that maximum pain if you are just a little bit hedged. You should be able to, well, if you do it uh, correctly, or if it, even if you just do some of the uh, balancing out of your portfolio, you should be able to stay long and be somewhat or significantly, depending on uh, how you do it or how significantly how much of the put options you do have uh, be hedged uh, against any adverse uh, market reaction. You know, you, the, we were talking about inflation, but again, market can surprise you and the, the life surprises you every time. I mean, the Delta variant could be the horrible thing that brings the market down or it could be nothing and the market will continue to rally and double from here. We don't know. So you want to stay long, you want to be positioned as best as you can, and you want to have hedges. The hedges will make you money when the rest of your portfolio does not. And almost by definition, <laughs> when your portfolio is doing fine, your hedge will lose out. And again, I'm, that's, that's, that's what hedging is. But you do it to stay safe, and you do it to make money when, when others don't, and we, when the rest of your portfolio doesn't. That's why you buy uh, selective puts. And again, you do it to the best of your ability. And you try to balance out your risks and uh, try to predict, again, to the best of your ability, how the market will react to this or that event. Today, we're talking about inflation. We do think it's the biggest risk of the market. But again, it may surprise you. And what I love what you're doing here is, and I want to explain because what we talk about it coming from the institutional side, this is this is normal, right? But for retail investors, most of you are just long. We're not telling you to go blindly short, right? Or naked short, anything crazy like that, where, you know, if it just goes the opposite direction, I mean, if you put money into a stock and it goes to zero, you lose whatever money you put in. But if you're short, it's infinite, right? You can go, go higher and higher, go to 1,000, 10,000 million, who knows? What you're doing is is when you're buying these puts and long-dated puts, you're, you're betting against the stock or sector. But if you're wrong, you're only losing the money you put in, right? So, uh, which is important to understand. Like you said, what if you lose that money, then you know, chances are a lot of things in, in your portfolio are probably doing well. But like we saw with COVID, and that's an extreme event. But even if we see, you know, I think I read a stat that we haven't seen a 5% pullback since October. I think I read that someplace uh, yesterday. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. But when you see a, I think a 5% I saw that. pullback, which, yeah, which means you know, if, if you've seen a 10% overall pullback in the market, you're going to see a lot of stocks down 20 25%. If that happens, I mean, the value of that put isn't just, hey, you know, I made a, a little bit of money. They can go up 3x, 5x what we saw during COVID. I mean, they can go up tremendously and, and account for a big part of your portfolio. But that's what, for me, you know, starting this company is not just about giving people stock prices, about educating them and educating how I've been doing this for 25 years and you've been doing this forever as well is because you know we hedge ourselves we do the research we do the homework and that educational component is tough but i think you know and even you could probably explain this better of how easy this is where you could do this from your e-trade account your metric account whatever account you have fidelity it's not a hard strategy it's very easy and you walk everyone through it but that's that's pretty much the, the basis of it right i mean it, it, and not only that you do have long positions and options and stuff like that that you've benefited greatly from in this newsletter too right Yes, we again uh, seeing how the this market is unstoppable. We kind of pivoted a little bit and uh, discussed uh, with you, and uh, we made uh, quite a few trades uh, that were for the market, not against the market, and we were able to have uh, booked some gains uh, last year and this year as well. But of course, uh, the, the main goal of a uh, money flow trader is still hedging. It's what it was created for, and this is what it's needed for. And I strongly believe that some hedging makes you safer. 
Some hedging makes you stay investing. And it's really not a difficult strategy to execute. And it's not as risky as, as you said, shorting. And again, speaking about shorting, uh, it was almost a theoretical exercise uh, talking about being short a stock and you could lose much more than you have put in. And it was almost a theoretical exercise until this year, incredible runs of all the, you know, game stops and AMC and the rest of the uh, <laughs> Wall Street bets uh, favorites. You really could have lost and hedge funds did lose a fortune on those short bets. Put options are different. Uh, you, even if you hold it until expiration, which every option do have, it does have expiration. Even if you hold a put option until expiration and your stock never reaches its uh, target and the option expires worthless, which can and does occasionally happen, all you can lose is the amount invested. That makes it easier to uh, plan and easier to understand just how much money you can lose and just how much of the losses, potential losses you can afford and balance out your risk reward scenario in terms of how much money you risk and how much of the potential reward can happen in this specific scenario. And that's really all there is. Uh, you can also trade call options, which is the opposite. You bet on the uh, stock's upside, but the basic uh, gain loss scenario is still very similar. You cannot lose more than you put in if you are long a call or a put option. Shorting mm -hmm. options is a totally different story, but we're, we're not going there. All we do is buying in the uh, money flow trader. Yeah, and, and thanks so much for doing because everybody's subscribed to that newsletter. I mean, how you describe it, how easy it is, and going through and walking people through through those steps is, is pretty amazing, which is awesome. So, uh, I wanted to transition next into unlimited income, one of the products that we just recently launched. Uh, and when I was looking at this product and when we talked, and, and I, I, I thought you were perfect for it because uh, when it came to unlimited income, there's thousands of products out there that are going to tell you how to generate income, and and I think you know as well as I do, ninety five percent of them are really not that good. Uh, it's a different formula. It's an art to it. It's it's you know I think people don't understand that it's more than just looking at hey this pays a high dividend that's great even though it pays a three percent or four percent yield if the stock goes down ten percent it's kind of useless right. Uh, explain the methodology in this and why it's different because uh, we'll go over your track record in a second, which is absolutely unbelievable. But uh, you know, why is your strategy, your uh, newsletter, your income newsletter different than anybody else's unlimited income? Well, I think what you want uh, with income, especially in this market, you, you don't want just the dividend because if you go for just the dividend, you are faced with the uh, basically two uh options you can either go for a relatively high dividend and or you can go for extremely low dividend high dividends are risky in this market and that's a problem why is it why are they risky because uh either they come from a enhanced uh, income vehicles such as possibly closed-in funds or maybe even an MLP uh, that pays out uh, specific income. And it's risky not just because it's uh, too leveraged. It's also risky because the underlying, the security that pays you that income, it's not likely to grow. If the company doesn't grow or in the case of a closed-in fund, a fund doesn't grow, they can't grow dividends. That's one. So your income stream is uh, at best steady. And two, uh, the price of that security is not likely to go up. And again, most more likely than not, it will decline over time because the company isn't growing. And if the company doesn't grow, what is the value of its future profits? 
the value of its future profits is going down. Hey, this is why uh, the company doesn't grow. You tend to see its price declining over time. And uh, when we talked about uh, unlimited income, our idea, we were basically on the same page, was to buy growing stocks. Income was almost a secondary factor in the, in this calculation. Of course, I say almost because we are buying this for income. But your your income must be growing, and it will be growing only if it comes from a growing company. And that's basically the idea and <laughs> the execution behind the uh, newsletter. No, and it's interesting because I think people believe that Warren Buffett just, you know, he is where he is today, just buying Wells Fargo and buying Coca Cola and holding on and, and compounding the dividends. No, it's compounding the dividends and the capital gains, uh, and, and that's what you have to realize. And and when we discussed this, and even you know launching this product, I was really excited about it. We were on the same page because I feel like that's not out there. There's not products like that. And just to show how much of this has been working, you know, I took a look at your track record before we came on. You have 18 stocks outside of the last one that you just recommended, which is down 0.8%, and that you recommended a couple of weeks ago. You're going to hold it long term, but 18 open positions, zero losses. Uh, you're obviously looking in the right places. Granted, it is, a, it is a bull market, but we've seen some, a lot of stocks get hit as well, individual names, even sectors. But you know, this formula seems to be working where I don't know a lot of income investors when I speak to them and ask them about that, they say the word growth ever. Like they don't say, well, you know, this is a good growth company and it pays a dividend. They're more like, oh, this pays a 5% yield. What do you think? It's never talking about the growth opportunities. You need that company to continue to grow. They could continue to raise those dividends. Uh, you know, a lot of times they buy back stocks. And again, you're getting that capital appreciation, which you, I, I just don't, for some reason, I don't hear a lot of people talk about that, even though that's the way some of the greatest investors invest, right? And uh yeah, the fact that you've done that with that portfolio is absolutely amazing. I know everyone has to be very, very happy, especially with the performance, the track record with it. So, uh, yeah, I'm just very – like the products that we launched and even especially the limited income, which is really, really cool. So uh, I'm glad – it's one of the last products we launched, as I said earlier. But great, great job. Okay. I wanted to give you a, you know, a compliment on that. And, and last you thing here, you know the deal. You you know the deal. What's good? What I'm going to ask you, right? <laughs> so everybody wants it and they love it. So, uh, you know, and I try to get this out of all my guests – uh, is there a pick that you can give away that uh, that you like right now around these levels and uh, and you could share with the audience? Yes, yes, I do. And actually, I have, uh, I have one for income lovers, but it's not going to pay you 5%. It's going to pay you 1.6% and with the potential of for that dividend going higher. And the condition for the dividend of going higher is the upcoming merger. merger. But let me, let me backtrack a little bit. The company is called Analog Devices, as simple as ADI. And the company, company actually it's, uh, calls itself ADI as well. So, I mean, I'll call it ADI from now on. So ADI is a semiconductor company. And uh, uh, it's, it's in that niche of the business where the margins are steady, the product turnover is relatively low, and uh, the um, market is uh, exactly where you want to be. It's uh, power management, it's uh, signal processing, it's automotive, it's everything you want specifically in 2021. And on top of this, it's buying a smaller, similar company and the merger is about they're likely to go through this summer and uh, as soon as they uh, complete the merger ADI promised they will reevaluate the uh, buyback and the dividend uh, uh, their programs so we'll potentially see a higher dividend from this uh, so again fingers crossed but it's a great company in a good business and you get a uh, semiconductor play, which is not Intel, for <laughs> for a nice yield mm -hmm. with a nice yield. 
No, that sounds great. Well, I think we covered a lot, right? We covered inflation, economics, money flow trader, <laughs> gave us a pick, and also limited income. So uh, yeah. listen, I, I just I say this to you almost every interview. I'm just so happy that you're part of our company. Uh, you provide incredible value to uh, uh, you know, all of our subscribers that subscribe to your products, and that's you know always the most important thing from my point of view. Uh, and just very, very you know proud to have you on, and, and love the job that you're doing, and keep doing what you're doing because I know you have a lot, a lot of fans, and that fan base continues to grow, which I know for a fact. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Hey guys, great stuff from Ginia. A money flow trader. I, I always talk about, and I love the fact that, that you know, she was in agreement with this and, and, and you know, just, we, we talked about this, but being able to adapt to market conditions, right? So we set up a portfolio and a newsletter designed to hedge position, which is great, right? It's done a great job during COVID, but when you see the market go up and up and up and up, you're taking losses on those positions while the rest of your portfolio is going higher. But adapting is always a big part. And she said, hey, you know what? There's a lot of ideas I like and started going along and buying calls and stuff. And, and just, you know, it's about 20, 25% of the, of the portfolio uh, and has done an amazing job, right? And, and that's what you should always do. Don't be stuck in your ways. Just like I talked about banks earlier. Don't never buy a bank. I'm never going to buy a bank. I'm never going to never say you're never going to do anything because conditions always change. Uh, you know, if you love gold, own gold. It doesn't mean you should only own gold and it's great every single, you know, year for the last 20, 30, 40 years. It's not. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. So being able to adapt and change it is very, very important. And I love that we did that money flow trader. Um Unlimited income is just just an amazing track record. One of fast growing newsletters for me. I always enjoy having her on. And the feedback I get from her subscribers is just super positive because even when she is wrong, uh, she lets you know exactly what to do with every position. So she's always transparent. She's always sending alerts. Uh, you know, from, from you know, business perspective, it's just that that's what this company is about, right? We want to help you guys. We don't want to disappear when you need us the most. When stocks are going up, you don't need us as much, right? You need us when, hey, well, this stock's going down. That's it's great to to get feedback from you guys where it's never most of the time it's like right i can't believe you recommended that stock it's hey should we buy more here what should we do and we always want to let you know what to do because if we're wrong let's get out of it fine take our losses take our lumps and we'll make it up someplace else uh you know but having her on board just you know she's brilliant uh just really happy she, she's part of our team but uh like i say i always say this uh you know this interview and and this podcast is about you not about me so let me know what you thought about interview frank cursoresearch.com that's frank at cursoresearch.com now, let's bring in Daniel to talk about all what's going on in the markets, which is not really too much, right? I like I hate saying that because it sounds like the podcast is going to be boring, but it's not. We got we got things to talk. But, you know, there's just a 24-hour news cycle, and they need to, to float news. There's not a lot of earnings going on, very little, and, you know, not really any crazy economic data than housing really kicking ass and showing huge growth, and job numbers came in better than expected. But, you know, we always want to break down the stories, and, and you know, I guess we could start with that because- you know, we see so much BS out there in terms of, you know, stories that they try to make a big deal out of, right? And it's got to be reported. And again, they have to report something. But one of the things I read in Wall Street Journal was, you know, a story from today. They highlighted how car deals are charging more than the sticker price for the first time ever. And it's due to, you know, the car shortage, supply chain issues. And, we, you know, Dan, we talked about this two months ago. And I'm not bringing this up to pat ourselves on the back. I mean, my job is always to bring you ideas, trends before you see in mainstream media. That's why, you know, boots on the ground is so important, getting out there and going to conferences, right? Uh, but more to the point here, it's a huge advantage for average investors. Huge. A huge advantage you have over Wall Street where a lot of these guys sit behind a desk every day and they're not in the real world. I mean, anyone who bought a car, which is, I bought a car and started doing a ton of research on the industry, knew how bad it was out there. There's no new cars on a lot, so we know that. We, I had to pay sticker price. I, it's insane. And, and, you know, if you want to order a car, it's going to take nine months, to, to at least nine months, they were telling me, to, to get it if you order to your specs and color and stuff like that. You have to buy what's on a lot and what's available, all the features. You can't say, well, I don't want this too bad. The guy behind you is going to buy it in like two seconds because there's nothing available. So they get to charge much, much higher prices. But they, I mean, these people, you, you would have saw the massive labor shortage. You did well before economists. You're able to see inflation, food, energy, and your bills. But yeah, it's a pretty big advantage that 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 I think investors have, retail investors have, Daniel, that, that you know, it, it really levels a playing field of Wall Street where they can get into ideas a lot quicker sometimes and, and know what's going on out there uh, faster than, than, than institutions. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's just great to have a network. And uh, like you always kind of say, man, everybody just needs to pay attention. If you look at your surroundings in your day-to-day -day life, you're going to have a pretty damn good reading on economics because that's all economics are. It's just a ton of de decisions 
being made by individuals. And that's why it's A, so fun and B, so hard to predict at times. I mean, savings rates through the roof because money is printed and given to people um, to take to go on the uh, autos. So I didn't realize how many. Did you know Berkshire Hathaway Automotive was one of the biggest, largest dealerships in America? I didn't, I didn't know, know that. that. Shouldn't shock you because hell, they own. I didn't know that. Though. I didn't know that. They have seventy-eight independent operated dealerships. This mm-hmm. is according to CNBC. I guess they had a uh, Uncle Warren as that cutthroat, wonderful businessman is called which is genius. Mm. And Charlie Munger, his business partner, did some kind of a success thing or whatever it aired on CNBC. Uh, But to their point, who would have thought that in March of last year, when you thought, oh shit, this is probably the worst time in the world to own autos. Fast forward a year, a little bit more, it's the biggest boom. They're printing. So I think Munger even had a quote where he said, they're printing coin. It shows you how old that 90 year old is. That's awesome. That's a great scene. (laughs) But um, you know, yeah, it's your point. So if you're if you're buying a car, whatever you're doing, pay attention. You know, what are grocery prices? And then figure that out. Constellation Brands. It is a week, slow time right now. Uh, oh, by the way, happy end of the second quarter. Today is the last day of the second quarter. Yep. Officially halfway through. So earnings season will kick off. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond reported today. Constellation Brands, the big uh, alcohol, and they have their fingers and everything damn near with um, consumers. So, yeah. But auto dealerships, what are you doing? Are you uh, Are you bullish going forward from here? Markets markets are happy about what happened, but what about, uh, you know, you, you talk about the chip supply mm-hmm. shortage and things like that. They're still going to have to deal with that, but look, the, the, chip the prices companies, are uh, high. Volumes can be low. Yeah, you know, technology. Look, the capacity that went from Taiwan Semi had, they have a certain amount of capacity. With autos do this system and the supply chain systems and what they do is more real time, and they didn't see this coming. So a lot of technology companies, whether Apple, surprisingly during COVID, really got the iPhone 12 out in time, right? So you see NVIDIA, a lot of these companies, because they saw it and say, hey, we need more capacity. And Taiwan somebody's like, okay, we didn't hear from the autos. And all of a sudden they use all the capacity at their plants and the autos are like, oh shit, we need, we need chips. And they're like, we don't have any space for you. And now they're building, they have to build new facilities, new fab facilities. Yeah. So when I look at the autos, I don't know how, you know, I was saying that Ford might be a good short here. And I'm a, I am was a very, very big fan of Ford for the last four years. I told everyone that they are more into EVs than any company I know of, including Tesla. And they thought I was crazy. I said, just look under the hood. I go to Consumer Electronics Show every year. And these guys have amazing technologies. They spent billions and billions to get into it, which hurt their stock. Now you saw the stock running up. But you look at GM and Ford near all-time highs. Uh to me, it's funny how they're talking the right talk, marketing-wise. They're talking about their EV portfolios in 2030. It's 2030. We're in 2021. Oh, EV portfolio is going to be great. They're talking that because they're going to see production declines anywhere from 25 to 40%, maybe even greater over the next two quarters. They're just not getting cars delivered. However, they could make up the difference because they're able to charge higher prices. I don't know. Uh, but I do know that these stocks are really inflated for the numbers that they're going to report the next two quarters, which are going to be disaster. And I don't see too many people talking about them. In general, when I look at the overall economy here, look, it's all about capital. Where is it flowing to, Daniel? Right. So, so where is the capital flowing to? We saw it flow into growth stocks for so many years, and really into we saw technology early on during COVID, and then we saw the rebound, the, the cyclicals, and the reopen trade. And some of those that took it taken, you know, come back a little bit, right? I still think that, you know, airlines, just buy any airline, you'd be fine. I mean, the, the reason why they haven't surged past all time highs like cruises and, and some hotels is because the international presence and, and now that's all opening up. Everything's opening up everywhere. So they're gonna see profits explode, people are ordering planes like crazy. That whole entire cycle that cycle is is as big as people are saying at times it by three. That's how big the, the the whole entire airline cycle is. I mean, in terms of supplies and parts and gonna go nuts and so now you saw a little bit of a slowdown at, but I saw something interesting where money's flowing into now. It's flowing into areas that are seeing the biggest capex spending, the most money being put into facilities, sectors, improving businesses, and that's materials, industrials, and real estate. And notice the numbers that came out. You notice that home build is starting to trend upward. You know, it's industrials, materials. Goldman Sachs just came out this week, said GE is their top idea. GE, holy cow. Don't get me started on G. I know don't listen to me ever for GE ever. Don't get me started. Okay? I admit when I'm wrong, I was wrong on G. I get it. I still get shit for that. I've been right on. Do great, great, great. But everyone's like, G. I get it. All right. But anyway, G, top idea. Morgan Stanley just raised their target on Textron. I think you probably know that, that target better than me, but I think it, it, they doubled the price target or something. 
So you're seeing money, and also Bank of America reported too, which tracks these flows. You're seeing a lot of money push into materials, industrials, and real estate. Probably a good trading opportunity over the next few months because that's what we want to do is get ahead of the markets and, and where's the money flowing into. And there you go. Like Those are the ideas that I'm seeing from my sources and also really good sources that track trillions and trillions of dollars. And now you're seeing these upgrades take place too. So a lot of people believe, and Textron does have a... You know, the component for airlines, anything airlines and manufacture with airlines, you're seeing uh, UAL announce a huge order. These guys have to announce massive, massive orders, demand is through the roof. You're going to see airline prices surge. It's just the perfect environment right now with everything opening up. And it's probably going to be the next 18 months, you'll probably make a lot of money. Even airlines, they're still 20% off their highs. I think they're going to surge to new to uh, all-time highs pretty soon. Yeah, that should help uh, Dollar Stock Club. We have Jets, the ETF for the airlines in there from Frank Holmes. Frank Holmes. Uh, speaking of the order from United Airlines, so the note, uh, I thought this was a misprint. This is just hilarious. So United Airlines CEO Scott Kirby was on CNBC mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. And uh, I was looking at the news feed. The company will purchase one new aircraft every three days until 2023. Mm -hmm. It's July 2021 right now. Mm -hmm. That puts it in perspective. You're buying a new airplane every three days until 2023. Um, then what do they do? Do they just depreciate them and then sell them to a Legion airline? Is that how they get so cheap uh, flights yeah, and stuff? By the way, I love Legion airlines. Spirit or whatever, but yeah. or JetBlue, JetBlue, JetBlue. People fly JetBlue. They still have like you know. It was so great because when they first came out, it was like the newest airline. <laughs> And they came with direct TV. Like, you can watch That's TV. That's East Coast, right? JetBlue? That's yeah. East Coast. You're like, okay. you can watch TV. So I read those planes, they're still the same. They never updated their fleet. So <laughs> that's, you know, Dave, that's why I really like Delta because Delta is, you know, and everyone has their favorite airlines depending on where you are. I like Delta because their hub is in Atlanta, which is right here. So, you know, I'm flying the newest planes with all new technology, all Wi-Fi, everything. Great. Uh, but that might not be the case in other places where people might hate Delta. But for me, they had the newest fleet. But now you have to see all these other people, all these other companies, airliners, they, they're upgrading their fleets. They have to with all the new technologies. Uh, and they put that on hold. And you saw that with Boeing, right? With all that, the MAX. And the MAX is the greatest plane ever in terms of fuel efficiency, faster. It's unbelievable, right? Of course, they had problems. But now that everything's taken care of, hopefully, and we don't see any more crashes, God forbid, uh, you're going to see these things fly off the shelf. So, so everyone... You know, outside of Delta, it's going to be ordering planes. I mean, there was a I think there was five fifty five hundred orders for 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 planes, and this was I think in two thousand nineteen when you know we were into the industry. We recommended Boeing before the crash and everything, uh, and got out of it. But the, all that demand has to come back because we're going to see more demand than there was in two thousand nineteen, which we're seeing right now. And you know, everything is open up even far. So it is pretty crazy. It is you know, I think we have to revisit some of our suppliers. Uh, Daniel, which we had a really cool supply, which we did very well on. I'm not going to mention the name because we're going to research him. It might be a good name again uh, that we got out of again, just to because you know pre COVID. Uh, you know, I just see when it comes to, to airline, and and I was able to visit the Boeing facility in Everett, Washington. You got to see it. It's basically assembly line for for massive jets. So they have like six, seven, eight in them at the same time, and it's you know bigger than Disneyland, bigger than Singapore. Right, this is one of the biggest facilities I think in the world. Unbelievable, but just seeing how everybody operates and the part makers and, and all the demand for the planes. This was, I think, 2018, maybe 17. I went there. Uh, that's when we came back, and I was like, "Listen, this the supply makers are going to just they're, they're going to profits are going to explode." And it did. It worked out. I, that's going to happen again. I think it's time to look at a lot of these suppliers because there's literally a hundred, more than a hundred companies that supply or have parts that go into a jet. Much more than 100. So 100 publicly traded companies that you can look at. And, and just finding those gems, uh, you could probably pick any one because you're going to see huge demand. But it is pretty cool, like seeing that demand coming back with airlines. And I'm going to be traveling pretty soon to Saratoga, uh, opening day. And uh, I booked my flight already. So hopefully there's no delays and no craziness. But I'll report to you guys on what I'm seeing because everyone's reporting to me right now, Daniel, uh, is saying that you know, everything's really, really crowded. It, it's really crazy. And it's even resulting in some delays. Real quick on the trip to Saratoga. Mm -hmm. Don't get on YouTube and don't don't be on YouTube or Twitter for the wrong reasons. Don't be getting in fights with airline attendants and customers. And <laughs> yeah. Don't get hauled off. If you get arrested, get a good mugshot. Um, mm -hmm. We are at headline risk here because it is kind of boring in the markets right now. I mean, we could always talk volatility in Bitcoin. We could always pull a few headlines, which we try to do to entertain you and educate you. Um, the airlines are the funniest things because I saw that one headline was they're going to start training flight attendants on self-defense again. I guess they once did that and then took it's it away. It's the anger. I mean, there's a lot of anger. It's it, 
So know. instead of, um, and you know, everything's being blamed on, well, people were cooped up and now they're getting back out. And I guess, you know, humans are just wild beasts and they don't know how to behave in public. Um, the mask thing is still pissing everybody off, which is hilarious. And now you're going to have to quit flying altogether because they've actually talked about getting rid of alcohol sales to combat bad behavior. Like that has to do with bad behavior. Yeah, they don't even serve you. you they know, should, in, in that quick. case, they should allow anyway, people I'm to, fun to, with that. Yeah, they should allow people to smoke weed. They'll calm them down. <laughs> it's better, right? I mean, you know, no alcohol, but weed for everybody. Right? Hey, marijuana. Uh, to get something beneficial out of this, capex on the capex theme. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the most disciplined areas of capex right now lately have been in the oil sector. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you know this much better than I do uh, with contacts and experience, but. It's just commodities are known for boom and bust, right? Because when prices skyrocket of your commodity, whether it be oil, gold, whatever, you borrow, you leverage, you produce as much as you can. Well, you do that and you get crushed and then your stock plummets and all that. And it's the cycle repeat. So this is from oilprice.com. This is just a few days ago. Uh, Free cash flow is set to hit a record-breaking $348 billion in 2021 for the big public world's oil firms. Okay? Okay. If you look at, according to Reuters, U.S. shale producers are going to make a combined $30 billion in free cash flow in 2021. Frank, why is that important? Because free cash flow is money left over at the end of the day after you pay for everything. Mm -hmm. So that's like keeping a giant mattress, you know, Scrooge McDuck style of just tons of money. Uh, How long will this last? Who knows? But it's going to last a little bit longer because oil prices are in the 70s now. I feel like they're going to 100, maybe not in a straight line, but you have a lot of tailwinds going there. And you still have demand coming back. Mm -hmm. And OPEC meets tomorrow. OPEC is the international cartel that controls a lot of production. Uh, They're going to come out with an announcement tomorrow, July 1st. We'll see what they do. But the whole point of this kind of fun tangent is this is just headline risk going forward. So uh, until earnings season kicks off in a few weeks for the second quarter, just just be prepared for some volatility around the Delta variant and COVID, uh, airlines going up and down with travel, uh, you know, places threatening to shut down or reopen. You mentioned international travel is opening up, but there's still some sectors that are, you know, or mm-hmm. some areas. Tokyo, I think, is in Japan are looking at being more strict and Canada. all that kind of Canada, stuff. Canada, I say, I joke around, it's, it's easier to get into <laughs> North Korea than it is to, to Canada right now. It's insane. I mean, they're, they're insane over there. They're insane. They're, they're uh, going on. I feel so bad. I, 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 and everyone I say is they email me, they're like, and they tell me this story of how bad it is over there. And, and I hate it because I love Canada. I love going there. It's yeah, just, I know somebody great. trying it's to just, get up to Canada uh, like fairly recently, and they're going to be gone at least two months because, yeah. you know, you got a quarantine on each side. Anyway. It's crazy. Um, but oil, I, I still think the oil producers um, have a lot, of, a lot of room to the upside here. Um, I've missed it. We haven't recommended anything to directly benefit that. We've been talking about it here. but So that's a frustrating thing. But uh, just pay attention to that. And there's a lot of, you know, there's always reason to be uncertain. So you should be long right now, be hedged a little bit. But just, just know that some crazy headlines are coming your way in the next few weeks. And prepare for it now so you're not a knee-jerk reaction type. And that's a good plug for Dollar Stock Club, too, because Dollar Stock Club... Again, it's by far cheapest newsletter. It's a couple of dollars. You can cancel whenever you want. But you come with a new idea from every one of my guests. And a couple of our guests, right, have talked. We had, I think it was Chris McIntosh a while ago, oil, which I thought he was, I didn't agree with it. I'm like, man, it's too early. It's too early. And he got in and he was a little bit early. He's a value investor and it came down a little bit, but now it's through the roof. So, you know, that's where you get to take advantage of, of you know, the network, right? And, and the people that we interview where we take a pick every week almost every week, just to balance. We have like an influencer or something, but most of the people we interview an analyst and we throw it in Dollar Stock Club and we have a nice one page report on it, PDF and, and, you know, break it down of, you know, why this person likes it, why we think it's good. You know, it, it, we, we screen some of these stocks. If they have four or five of them, you know, I, we'll look at them and we'll pick them. Uh, but we make sure that, you know, these are stocks that these people like and, and you know, that portfolio has been doing very, 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 very well. And, uh, you know, that, that's just a good plug for it because things that we do miss, at least, you know, some of the analysts that do come on here don't. And I got to give Chris McIntosh some credit because he nailed that one. So uh, I will go back to planes and, and road rage. I've seen it. I mean, it's everywhere. It, it, it's, I don't, I don't get it though. Right. I mean, I mean, when you're in a car, right. I mean, if someone, if, if you're in a store, Daniel, or if you're at a bar or whatever, and someone just bumps into you, walks by, and doesn't say anything, you're going to be like, Hey man, come on. Right. If someone cuts you off in a car, I mean, you chase them down and you're like, I'm going to effing kill you. Like this, this rage comes and now it's on airplanes. I think it's just, 
One is, why the hell are we still wearing masks on airplanes? It's the safest environment possible, right? With the, with the air coming in, it's all filtered, the air coming in. We know, even over your nose, again, it's got to come out your nose and go into somebody's mouth. And It's a joke, right? It's all been unproven now. You don't, you don't need masks, right? It's not going to do anything. And most people are vaccinated, whatever. You know, but mandatory over your nose, over your mouth. And I think people are just like... I mean, people in Florida are sick of it, and for a year we've been we haven't really, you know, we've had everything dialed down, everything open. They just started to open up in New York. They just started to open up in other places, and, and people are sick of it. So, I mean, the airlines really, instead of having all of your, you know, employees take self defense courses and how to beat the shit out of, out of the passengers, maybe you should just get rid of the masks because that's probably going to help a lot and serve alcohol, and everybody would be fine. Just that's what they want. They're going away. They're traveling. They want to have fun. They want to frick a mask on where you're going to walk by every two seconds. And say, get that mask over your nose. It's like, come on, man. So you know that that's probably easier than going through this whole training shit. But that's just my opinion. What do I know? Yeah, could be. I don't know. Good luck. Good luck having that uh, new rule implemented. <laughs> So the last thing you know, we want to talk about is, I mean, the Reddit crowd, man, it's a force, right? It's a massive yeah. force. Uh, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond came out. A, you know, we saw Bed Bath & Beyond, and this was a stock that was very, very low. I mean, even if you look at six months ago, or you look at the year chart. Year chart, this thing was below 10. Then it flew all the way to like in the 50s. And it's so fun. I look 52-week range between 7 and 53. And yeah. Uh, it's now 30, but it's up like 12%. I think it was up early. It was up a lot more than that. It was that up today. almost 30% earlier. Yeah. Oh yeah. They reported earnings better than, well, actually earnings per share missed a little bit, but they were profitable. You know, they had some good growth numbers, but yeah. the big takeaway here is there's around, give or take 20% of the stock short. And of yeah. course that's an yep. easy recipe right now in the it current environment. It didn't matter what they reported, right. what the earnings were. It didn't matter. I mean, well, I, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say- I mean, they missed- As long as they wrote, yeah, but they missed by a few penny. They were still profitable. I was actually shocked by that. I was expecting them- I was impressed by that. They, I think they reported three, three cents earnings instead of eight, so they were missed by five. Um, but hell, I was still impressed with that. Anyway, like you said, the the big one there is short interest. Um, and Bed Bath <laughs> the and retail Beyond, crowd listen, just grabs I, that and just rolls with it. It's great. I mean, and they're here but, to stay, Frank. Yeah. Right? Why would the individual investor leave all of a sudden? There's no reason to. No, there's no reason to. You can still right. push stuff around. You can still control volatility mm-hmm. uh, in certain areas. I'm not. I'm not. I use the word control loosely. That's probably not the best term, but you can still cause massive short squeezes. Uh, everything that was going on during the GameStop and all that kind of stuff is still prevalent. You still have hedges in place on a lot of people. You know, it's an ego-driven thing. You, you're still got. You don't think people are going to look at the fundamentals of Bed Bath and Beyond and, and short it somehow? And again, through puts and your conversation with Genia, you can do that in a risk-adjusted way. Hell, yeah. who cares if you're short if you know how much you're going to lose? Yeah. yeah, it sucks to lose. Yeah, it but sucks to lose, but you know how much you can still cause uh, uh, short squeezes. You can still use options that cause you know melt ups and meltdowns and all that kind of stuff. So overall, that's great. The retail investor uh, shouldn't leave. Uh, I'm glad to see more of it, and I don't I don't mind that. I don't agree or care that there's an argument out there that you know the stock market is a casino. It's no more of a casino today than it was ten years ago. There's just more money and more people involved in it. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm bringing up a chart of best, I, Bed Bath & Beyond. Bed Bath & Beyond is, you know, they include in Reddit, but it's actually, you know, it's a legit company. Is it expensive? It's a little expensive. But when we look at other things, and I have the chart up here, if you guys are on a Curzy Research YouTube page, you can follow along. Uh, I mean, you look at GameStop. I mean, GameStop's insane. I mean, this company doesn't have a business model. They just announced they're going to get into NFTs like two months ago, and that market's dead. I mean, what's the next market they're going to get into, right? They're trying to partner with, with I think... Uh, Getting into you know uh, cryptocurrencies and, and you know what a trading opportunity whatever it is you know but it, it's you know what's what's next for them fifteen billion dollar market cap and you know it's a company again going through going through these numbers here five five billion in sales but just massive massive losses piled up and then you know you have AMC which <laughs> AMC is actually awesome and this is a company that's at fifty six okay twenty eight billion dollar market cap. So Dan, when when I look when I look at AMC, I, I just want to put this in perspective for you guys. So in 2018, that's where we had record box office receipts, right? Sales. They hit a record pretty close to $12 billion. AMC finished that year with a market cap of 1.8 billion. This year, we have box office receipts at 1 billion. Maybe it gets to two, three, four billion, you know, with the theaters starting to open up, the industry's making a comeback. AMC's market cap is $28 billion. I mean, <laughs> based on the numbers, you would have to see box office sales based on the 2018 valuation go up 
a factor of 14. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible when you look at it where, uh, you know, the market cap of this company, even that the executives are like, you know, it doesn't represent the fundamentals or whatever, but you, know, you got to hand it to the Reddit crowd and you don't want to mess with them because, you know, the more you tell them no, it's like, you know, your, your daughter bringing home the guy that you don't like and you're trying to say, obviously, I'm not talking about my personal situation at all. <laughs> Hopefully this never happens to me, my two daughters. But you know, she brings home the guy you don't like and you say, I don't want him to see him anymore. She's going to marry him, right? So, you know, you got to be very, 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 very careful Uh because the more you talk about bad about this crowd, the more you talk, you know, bad about how, you know, we have a, an analyst out there says AMC, the target price is still a dollar, right? So, you know, the more they make you look bad and uh, it's pretty crazy. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of cool things that we're going to start tracking, guys, in terms of, you know, algorithms, tracking uh, the amount of posts on Reddit and, and Wall Street bets and stuff like that, because you could determine you know, a lot of the stocks they're talking about, you could see what they're talking about. And a lot of that leads to more and more and more posts. And you can almost see it. Like when's it like Cleveland Cliffs was on that list, like three, four, like probably about four or five days before it really took off. Uh, you know, you see a lot of stocks on that list that, that just surprise you. And next thing you know, you know, the whole Reddit crowd is really getting behind it because you know, Daniel, I mean, they almost put, kind of put Melvin Capital out of business and even Capital Infusion, which is a $12 billion firm. But these guys get behind one of your stocks, so you're in one of those stocks. Holy cow, you, you can get like four, five, seven thousand percent gains pretty quickly. I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, dismiss it. I'm an analyst and fundamentals, Maddie, look at technicals, whatever. The bottom line is you're watching stocks go up thousands of percent. And from my point of view, you need to find out a formula of why that's happening and how you can get ahead of it, right? That's that's what you want to do. And, and yeah, that might be one way, and we're going to probably add that feature to uh, Dollar Stock Club in the future, which I'm excited about. But man, this Reddit crowd is 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 pretty nuts, Daniel. Huh? Yeah, it is, and overall, I think it's good. I mean, um, listen, if you ever see skeptics or uh, people venting about how Wall Street is uh, a casino or silly and all that, that's not individuals. That's because of the Fed and the liquidity and the money printing and all that. So don't confuse reality. Don't blame reality on something. On just one ingredient, uh, especially when it's not a large ingredient. But um, you know, look for things that are an easy screen would be to look at something that has a tailwind. Cleveland Cl Cliffs is perfect because it had a higher short interest, I believe, and they're in the steel. And steel is going through the roof with infrastructure and things like that coming down the pipe, or at least anticipated. Yeah. And uh, raw material costs are going higher, so that was a great kind of one-two punch there. And uh, I think it's a little bit off its highs, but man, it's hard to imagine materials like steel not continuing to hire or at least stay elevated, which are going to be good for companies as they report earnings. So, Yeah, no, all great stuff. I, I'm going to end with this, Daniel, which is, which is cool. So Friday, I'm going to a concert. It's at uh, you know, Jacksonville Stadium, TIAA Stadium. They used to be at Everbank Field. Uh, and it's Motley Crue, Poison, Def Leppard, and Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. Old so school. Nice. This is on Friday. So my wife and I are super excited and, and you know, a lot of tickets. And the, the concert was pushed back, right? We saw it was pushed back and then they had like a big push, you know, hey, you know, this concert's coming. And so we got tickets and then I looked and I'm waiting to get the tickets. And then I noticed that, wait a minute, this concert's on Saturday. Because July 2nd is Saturday. And I was like, no, no, July 2nd is Friday. And I look and the tickets are for next year. Oh, <laughs> well, that's not far off. Next year. A whole year. Shit? And we actually are going to see the Google Dolls, and they have they they just suspended or whatever they canceled, it, and it's it's going to be next year around this time. So who going to be very busy next year? Who with concerts. Who, who canceled the bands and Get, or uh, the promoters? What what happened? Google Dolls rescheduled. I don't know what happened with this, but the way they sold it was very very shady because you know just so you just they have get a concert your money coming back? out. They have a concert that they're going through, and then. With this venue, I mean, even my wife looked at it, and it's July, it's coming up, and, and the way they presented it, I didn't see 2022 anywhere. She didn't even see 2022 everywhere. I know a lot of people made the same mistake, and, and oh, that you sucks. Know, I was pissed because we're like, oh, it's going to be really cool, have some beers and hang out and, and enjoy it. So now i got to try to take her out Friday. I don't know where to go. How do you top that? You can't. Well, yeah, that's going to be tough. It's Plus, it's going to be crowded as hell with the 4th of July weekend. So yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe just stay home. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm really pissed off at that. But anyway, uh, next year I'll tell you year, how that that's concept fantastic. was. That's a pain. <laughs> that's fine. So, Dan, thanks so much for coming on, man. I appreciate breaking down all the stories of the week. And we'll see you next week. And, uh, yeah, hopefully you have a great, great 4th of July, buddy. Yeah, cheers, everybody. All right, so uh, just one quick note here. So Friday, July 9th, we're going to have our annual shareholder meeting, our first ever. That's for, uh, you know, Curzy Equity Owners Token, which, you know, gives you direct equity stake in our business. Uh 
So going to update you on all the, you know, what happened in 2020, our, our future, what's going on, you know, the highlights of 2020, going over all of our financials, which are audited now, which went through the whole auditing process and, uh, you know, very proud to say, but we got lots of good things coming on because this industry is really starting to explode as I explained. Uh, and just uh, very, very exciting time. So it's going to be really cool. I'm going to break down everything about to more important, just uh, great things about what's coming in terms of increased liquidity, including partnerships, uh, you know, really cool stuff. We've been working very, very hard on over the last six, seven months because through COVID, a lot of this stuff just was halted. And now you're seeing more exchanges come out. You're seeing this industry grow from, it was like 250 million. It's it's approaching a uh, you know, billion dollars now. And this thing's going to really, really start taking off. And this is just in the past few months. So you're seeing that right now. You see more platforms get developed. And now there's being a major push into, into security tokens. Uh, and we're right in the forefront. We're interviewing guys, the top names in the industry. Uh, but it's going to be really cool. I'm going to highlight the growth initiatives of what we're doing with Curzio Research going forward, which is very, very, very exciting. So we position ourselves perfectly. We spent a lot of money to build the infrastructure because of margins, and it's very easy to scale our industry and in publishing, but also becoming a financial media company uh, and, and how we're expanding our presence uh, on uh, – you know, different channels, doing videos on YouTube. So we're going to break that down. It's for free, guys. Just if you want to attend, if not, no worries. But, you know, we'll really break down security token industry, our company, and I'm really looking forward to it. So that's coming out on Friday, July 9th. I'll send you guys the details and the exact time when it's coming out. But uh, working hard to put that together, that whole presentation together. So you'll hear from me then if you're interested. If not, no worries. Again, it's absolutely for free. Just giving you an update, especially if you're looking to buy our token or if you're a, a current shareholder. Uh, so guys, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you enjoy. You have a great, great 4th of July. Spend it with your family. A lot of places are now open. Have barbecues, drink, have fun. Have a great time. I wish I was going to my concert. <laughs> I'll find something else to do with my wife this week. And uh, as always, I'll see you guys in seven days. Take care.